Good evening. Can everybody hear me in the far corners of the room? Great. Welcome. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. Thank you for joining us tonight for our lecture. We're going to talk about uh, three things that may not always go together, right? Climate change, natural disasters, and human rights. And we're delighted to have our colleague uh, Elizabeth Ferris out from Brookings. It's her first trip as a Brookings scholar here. Also her first trip to Las Vegas. So she's been getting the full indoctrination to uh, all of those topics and more. She's been, some of you students have had her in your classes. She's met with faculty. She's obviously giving a lecture tonight. Uh, I know you'll find it interesting. Let me tell you a little bit about Elizabeth. She's a senior fellow in foreign policy at Brookings and co-director of the Brookings LSE project on internal displacement, where her work encompasses a wide range of issues related to internal displacement, humanitarian action, natural disasters, and climate change. Prior to joining Brookings in 2006, she spent 20 years working in the field of humanitarian assistance, most recently in Geneva, Switzerland with the World Council of Churches. Her most recent book, The Politics of, of Protection, The Limits of Humanitarian Action, was published by Brookings in 2011. She has her graduate degrees from the University of Florida, her undergraduate degree from Duke, and at a time where we're both mourning the passing and celebrating the life of Coach Tark, I think it's only appropriate that we have a blue devil out here. There's something circular about that. Please don't hold that against her, and welcome Elizabeth. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here in Las Vegas with the sunny skies and the smiling faces and learn a little bit more about this part of the country that I don't know very well. I'm going to talk tonight about climate change and its impact on the movement of people. You know, from the very first report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, way back in 1990, there was a recognition that one of the main effects of climate change was going to be on the movement of people. People wouldn't be able to stay where they were for forever, and that movement would take different forms. Now, as Bill said, I spent most of my professional life working with displaced people, you know, traveling to refugee camps and every corner of the world and looking at people recovering from natural disasters in places such as the Philippines and Japan and many Pacific Islands. And, you know, what you see in those situations is a real resilience and a real plea to stop the progress of climate change. Sometimes you talk to people, for example, in Pacific Islands who say, we're not causing this. You know, the amount of carbon that we are emitting is minuscule, and yet the impact of climate change on our lives, our cultures, our histories are, are huge. Please tell the world to stop, stop this process so that we can continue to live the lives that we've wanted to live for, for generations. So when you talk about climate change, it isn't just a big abstract scientific issue. It's an issue I think that's too important to leave to the, to the scientists. It's one that affects human lives and the way people live and aspirations and what kids hope to do. And I hope as we talk about the, the way in which climate change may affect the movement of people that we can hold human beings in mind and not just the very real and often some terrifying and often confusing science of it all. It's clear that climate change will make certain parts of the world uninhabitable. It isn't so clear where this will happen, when it will happen, if it will happen the next five years or the next three decades or the next 200 years. You know, the, the science on that isn't, isn't terribly clear. But as temperatures warm, as the sea level rises, as we get more intense and unpredictable weather events, it's clear that all of these will impact the habitats that we depend on. This is the tiny island of Tuvalu in the Pacific, population about 10,000 people. If you look carefully, you see it's just a tiny sliver of land. The whole issue of sea level rise is an existential issue for people living on this and on many other islands. The sea doesn't have to rise very far before this island, this country, this culture is inundated. 
But long before the island is submerged, supplies of clean water will be contaminated. There are already signs of seawater intrusion, as they call it, into the limited freshwater supplies. Now this may look like a photo of one of the Florida Keys, and we have roads like this in, in the U.S. as well. But this is a road in Tuvalu that links the southern and the northern parts of the island. Again, you can see it doesn't take a very big storm to wash out that road. So when we talk about climate change, we don't necessarily have to be talking about a rise of sea level of 10 meters or 50 feet. It could be inches that could make a difference in the lives of people living in this part of the world. But it's not just in the tiny island nations of the Pacific where climate change is having an impact. We saw in 2011 drought in, uh, in I'm sorry, famine in, in Somalia caused in part by drought. You know, famine is never really caused by natural phenomena. It's not really caused by droughts. Famine is caused by an intersection of politics and conflict and inadequate response and failure to heed warning signs. And all those occurred in the case of Somalia, where 250,000 people died, and they didn't have to die. As climates get warmer, as droughts get longer, larger parts of the globe are likely to see drought. And some parts of the world where drought has not been common may suddenly make an appearance. And this isn't just something that happens over there in the Horn of Africa, but certainly in Southwest U.S. and other places. The, this is the daily drought monitor from last week showing the areas where there's been prolonged drought. And certainly some recent articles and scientific studies suggesting that we could be in for a very long period of drought here in the Southwest, talking of decades-long drought. You know, that raises questions of you know, how long can communities and economic growth be sustained if the water is depleted at ever-increasing rates. Um, you know, drought can also displace people, not just storms and sea level rise. Climate change is particularly affecting movement of people because of where we live. We live in an increasingly urbanized world. I think it was two or three years ago we passed the 50% mark. Now 54% of the world's population lives in cities. And they don't just live in cities, they live in coastal cities. More and more people moving toward the coast. In the U.S., about half of our population lives within 50 miles of the coast. Countries like Australia, the figures are even higher. You know, what does it mean when more people are moving to the coast, living in more densely settled communities, and you have these major storms and more intense and more unpredictable storms? Um, furthermore, we have a pattern in, in many parts of the world, too many parts of the world, of deforestation, land degradation. That means when a natural hazard occurs, it's more likely to become a disaster. A heavy rainfall in Nepal, for example, can turn into a monumental landslide, not because the rain is coming down so heavily, but because the forest cover has been depleted for for industrial or agricultural development means the impact of that rain translates into landslides which translate into destruction and too often death. The world cities, here are a few photos of Miami, so close, so such a beautiful city, but so close to the water. What's, what's, who's thinking about long-term impacts of climate change on cities such as Miami and Manila, which has experienced a great deal of uh, the number of typhoons and storms. The Philippines gets about 20 typhoons a year and has developed, I think, one of the world's best um, systems for disaster risk management, very sophisticated ways of, of having early warning systems and preparing communities and getting people out of the harm's way. But you know, what will happen if the storms get get stronger and more frequent um, at the same time that the city's population is increasing? For the first time, the, the climate change framework, the architecture that we have that negotiates climate change um, issues, um, decided back in 2010 at a meeting of their conference of parties to recognize that 
Adapting to climate change isn't just about building structures and planting mangrove forests, but that a good way, a possible way, a way that will be used to adapt to climate change is for people to move. This has happened for tens of thousands of years. When, when environmental degradation occurs, when people can no longer survive where they are, they move. That happened in, you know, throughout the southwest of the United States. It happened in the Arctic areas. People have moved in response to climatic conditions. But now it's recognized by those working on climate change that movement, mobility is a form of adaptation. And in particular, three types of mobility are mentioned. Migration, displacement, and planned relocation. Let me just say a few words about each of those three. Migration is assumed in international law to be voluntary. People move because they choose to do so. I was an economic migrant working in Geneva, Switzerland, not a hardship post for many years. I was a foreigner living outside of my country and working. And millions of Americans study abroad and travel abroad and are tourists. Um, but you know, migration for a longer term is, is seen as a voluntary action. In the context of climate change, People will migrate before things get terrible. When they see the handwriting on the wall, they will make a decision to move. Sometimes they will do it a you know, family deliberation. Sometimes those deliberations will take years. Is it time to go? Might things get better? What do we do about the kids? Where can we go? Most of this migration will be internal, that is, within a country. So people living in drought-stricken areas will move to cities or small towns. Some of it will be international. And uh, things are really bad in my country. Maybe I ought to think about working someplace else. Um, so they will make a decision to move beforehand. I met a, a pastor from Kiribati, another small Pacific Island country who said, I'm sending my son to study in Australia. I hope he finds a job there. I hope he settles down there because I know there's going to be nothing for him to come back to. That is voluntary migration. But is it really so voluntary when a father says, I'm sending my son away so he has a chance to live because our traditional area can no longer support him? We think that migration, voluntary movement, will be used most by people with means. People who have possibilities in other countries or cities. People who have money to travel. You know, we know for economic reasons that the poorest of the poor, they're not the ones who migrate. They're the ones who don't have money for a bus fare to get to a city or who are trapped in a particular situation because of family obligations or other reasons. But people who move voluntarily are likely to have more means, be more wealthy than those who can't move. And I'm always impressed with Kiribati, as I said, another small Pacific Island population, 100,000. Its government adopted a policy called Migration with Dignity. And what their government said was, we see the handwriting on the wall. Because of climate change, our country is going to disappear. But we don't want our citizens to go begging around the world saying, please, take me in. Please, my country is gone. Please, give me a... We want our people to have dignity. And so they set up programs to train many of their of their citizens and skills that would be marketable around the world. So they set up an agreement with Australia to train nurses to Australian standards. And nurses can get jobs just about anywhere. They set up another program with Germany to train stewards to work on cruise ships, a, a growth industry. And uh, the Kiribati men, in particular, went through those programs so they could be able, when the time comes, or beforehand, to migrate with dignity, not to have to depend on what the Kiribati government called charity. Those who cross borders, go to another country for reasons of climate change, will do so as typical, ordinary economic migrants. There is no special category in international law for those who leave their countries, either because of a disaster, such as an earthquake in Haiti, or because of a tsunami, or because of the impact of, of the effects of, of climate change. It's a gap in international law that some are working to develop, but it's a political, political minefield. Okay, so people will move voluntarily. 
And then there will be people who are forced to leave, who are displaced, who don't have that luxury, if you will, of having time to sit around the kitchen table and decide if it's time to move or not. These forced uh, movements, displacement, usually happen after a disaster, after Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines in 2013. You know, four million people were displaced. Their homes were destroyed. They had to leave. The floodwaters came. They were the ones who, who survived, who got away. Um, sometimes they leave because of uh, loss of livelihoods. Drought in particular devastates agricultural communities. Farmers who are used to farming or pastoralists who herd their livestock through established patterns and find that drought changes all that. They can, they can no longer survive where they were. They, they, there's no choice in it. They, they have to move. Um, displacement affects both rich and poor. I mean, we saw with Superstorm Sandy in the United States that rich people had to evacuate and leave and poor people as well. You know, the way in which they cope is sometimes different just because of the resources that they have. Most displacement is internal, not very much displacement is cross-border. And again, people who cross borders um, do so through existing economic migration channels. You know, it's popular to hear the term climate change refugee. Those of us who work with refugees, it's kind of like hearing a fingernails on a blackboard. You know. The term refugee is solidified in international law. There's a convention. The convention's being eroded as it, it will. You know. If you look at the situation of refugees, those fleeing conflict and persecution, it's getting harder and harder for them to gain entry. So there's a fear among those working with refugees that if you start referring to climate change refugees, including millions, possibly, tens or even hundreds of millions of people, that particular protection afforded to those fleeing conflict might be eroded. And finally, there are planned relocations. This is the area that, that the least is known. And this is when governments have to move people to protect them. It can happen before a disaster. This area is no longer safe. You've got to move. More likely, it happens after a disaster. The flood has happened. The tsunami has happened. We're going to move you. You can't go back. So in the Philippines, of the 4 million people who were displaced, the governments decided that 1 million have to be permanently relocated to a safer place. Think about what that involves. Building houses is the easy part. Physically transporting people isn't a problem. Reconstructing livelihoods, communities, getting the jobs, making sure the public transport is there, that kids have schools, that community uh, mechanisms are reestablished. That takes a lot of commitment and time and money. There are also cases when communities have decided on their own. We have to move. We can no longer survive here and ask the government for support. That's happening this week in Alaska where indigenous communities have made the decision, supported by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and reams of studies that they can no longer live where they are um, because of the effects of climate change and have asked the federal government for help. Can you help us move? Now these are small communities, 300 people, 500 people. But it's, it's complicated, it's expensive, it's politically difficult to make the decision to move a community as a community from one place to another. The people who are most likely going to need assistance from the government to permanently relocate are probably those who have the least. Those who have means will go early. Those who are displaced in the aftermath of a disaster, there's usually more support than these long-term planned relocations. These relocations are already occurring in the Carteret Islands and the Pacific, as I said, in Alaska. The outcomes, you know, the success stories, the good practices we have when communities are moved for other reasons, say to build a big dam or other development projects such as creating a national park or urban renewal programs, the, the results aren't very good. Usually people who are relocated end up worse off than they were before. But there are differences within the community, some benefit, but a lot of people aren't able to um, improve or at least maintain their lifestyles. Talk just a minute about sudden onset disasters, which is going to be one of the drivers of migration. This is a hurricane, obviously. 
And to go in, not not to go into the definitions, but you know, a natural hazard, a natural phenomena, doesn't by itself make a disaster. You can have a terrible tsunami that sweeps over an uninhabited island. That is not a disaster. It's the relationship of that natural phenomena to the ability of the society or the community to cope with it, to deal with it. I, I live in Bethesda uh, near Washington, and there's a little creek near my house that. When we get about two inches of rain, it overflows and the road's blocked and everybody knows what to do. That is not a disaster. I mean, it's, it's something that people can cope with. Um, and so you have many small disasters that never make it into the newspapers because governments can cope, communities can respond. The question, as I mentioned earlier, how natural is natural? Haiti's deforestation is legendary. The amount of the forest cover that's been destroyed in the name of agricultural and industrial development is striking. In 2004, Haiti had four bad hurricanes, um, killed 800 people. Cuba had the same four bad hurricanes, killed six people. The difference is deforestation. The difference were systems of preparedness and response. The difference also was a more authoritarian government that could say, you've got to move, so move now. Instead of, here's the warning, you know, you, you might want to pay attention to this. So there's a different approach that you know, accounts for that. But certainly the deforestation in Haiti and many countries has, has contributed to these disasters. To mention the example of wildfires, you know, are wildfires natural hazard induced or caused by humans. According to U.S. records, about 86 percent of all wildfires over the last 20 years in the U.S. have been human caused um, rather than natural phenomena of lightning and so forth. It's the only natural disasters where humans can intervene to actually stop the progress of the disaster. You know, when there's a flood, you can you know, put up sandbags, but you can't stop that flood. When there's a hurricane, we don't have technology yet to stop the hurricane or change its direction. But wildfires, we have a means of intervening. I mean, certainly gotten a lot smarter and a lot more effective in our fire prevention fire policies. In the U.S., you see a decrease in the number of fires from 100,000 a year to only 50,000 a year in the last 50 years. But there's an increase in scope, the numbers of acres for each, uh, each of the wildfire, as well as a tenfold, or hundredfold increase, tenfold, sorry, increase in the number of houses destroyed. You know, people are living closer to forests. Um, the settlement patterns, people are encroaching on that wild forest acreage in ways that make it more likely that humans will be affected when there is a wildfire. Wildfire is one of the f hazards that's most likely to increase as a result of climate change. Hazards usually distinguish between slow onset, drought, desertification, sea level rise, and rapid onset, cyclones, storm surge, flash flooding, earthquakes, volcanoes not related to, we don't think related to climate change. Some of the trends in sudden onset disaster, the good news is, is that fatalities are way down. The number of people who die in natural hazards, natural disasters, has, has declined tremendously. The bad news is more people are affected, more people are being displaced, and the higher economic costs. As disasters hit urban areas, as they're bound to do just because that's where most of the population is living, the economic cost increases, built structures cost more to replace than, than small huts or modest homes. Um, more people are affected, people are you know, evacuated and move and displaced. Uh, it's great that they're not being killed, but it's, it's certainly increasing the pressure on societies and governments to do something. Hydrometeorological disasters, those are related to water and climate, account for 87% of disasters, that's floods, storms, cyclones, typhoons, 74% of losses, 61% of fatalities, and something like 80% in a typical year of these hydrometeorological disasters occur in Asia. It's very concentrated. Uh, disasters occur one after another. The impact on human resilience when you have a flood, you rebuild, two years later another flood, three years later another flood, it wears people down. And then there are cascading disasters such as Japan. Japan you had a major earthquake that caused a tsunami, 
that cause damage to nuclear reactors. So it's kind of a chain reaction, if you were. Not everybody is affected e equally. As all these people are moving to the cities, poor people are living on the most marginal land, the land that others didn't want, the land that's most susceptible to sudden onset disasters. They tend to live in poorly constructed ha housing, tend to be the ones most affected. Makes sense, those who are less physically mobile, the elderly, children, those with disabilities are often uh, find it more difficult to evacuate. In terms of flooding, death rates for women are four times the rate for men. Four women die in floods for every man globally. That's usually because of cultural reasons. Girls may not learn how to swim or climb trees. Their dress may make it difficult for them to escape. Often they're holding children because they're the primary caregivers. And when you're holding a toddler, it's, it's hard enough to hold a toddler, but when you're holding a toddler and trying to grab onto something, it makes it very difficult. In societies where so social gender norms are much more equal, that difference d doesn't play out. So in Germany, when there were floods, the death rates for men and women were about the same. And finally, you know, the best intention relief efforts can knowingly or unknowingly discriminate against particular groups. May not, un may not even recognize that they are benefiting members of a certain caste. Um, maybe they hired unknowingly uh, people who spoke English who happened to be a high caste and therefore when the aid was distributed, different types of aid were given to different groups. Or, or maybe sometimes well-meaning groups hand out water or food or relief items to everybody in line but don't ask the question of who's not in that line. Are the really old people standing in line for hours? Are the people on crutches standing in line? Where are the kids? I mean, so that there are ways in which the relief efforts themselves can discriminate. This is just a map of those who were displaced by um, sudden onset disasters. About 22 million people last year in every region of the world. We think most of that displacement is temporary. You know, the floods come, you leave your home, the floodwaters go down, you go back. But nobody knows. There's not a single government that is keeping track of the number of people who were displaced and when they return or if they return. And then there's climate change. As I mentioned, one of the um, expectations is that climate change is going to affect these disasters, make them more frequent, more extreme, more unpredictable. <laughs> Here's a, a table that was done by the Union of Concerned Scientists showing the relationship between different types of disasters and climate change. Now we don't hear much about heat waves. M maybe you do here in Las Vegas, but heat waves don't seem the same intensity as hurricanes or droughts. And yet heat waves are killers. In 2003, a heat wave in Europe killed 70,000 people. Wait a minute, this is Europe, 2003. 70,000 people died because of a heat wave. Primarily older people who were alone in their apartments <coughs> died of um, the effects of heat wave. Nobody even knew they were there. Kids forgot to check, whatever. 70,000 people. As heat waves become more intense, they're likely to become even more drastic in terms of their impact on humans. Coastal flooding, extreme precipitation events, droughts, those are likely to be associated with um, with climate change and global warming. Finally, I thought I'd close with just a few examples of how climate change is affecting mobility right, right now. And I'll start with the Carteret Islands. This is a set of about, used to be six islands off the coast of, tiny, tiny islands <coughs> off the coast of Papua New Guinea. This is a, a photograph. You can see where the king tides and the salt water is taking over much of the island, making it impossible for them to continue to produce food as the salt water has damaged things. This is where they are, 2,700 inhabitants, six small islands. And you think if, if you're only talking about 2,700 people, surely it wouldn't be too difficult to find some place else for them to go. The people on the Carteret Islands decided about 10 years ago they had to move. They didn't have a choice. They couldn't stay there. They couldn't farm. They went from being self-sufficient to depending on, on food shipments coming in. About 50% of the surface of the islands has been lost due to rising sea level. So they decided they're going to have to move to the mainland in Papua New Guinea. The actual area was Bougainville where there's been a war. 
But they've spent 10 years looking for a place to settle. There's a powerful little documentary about this called Sun Go Down, if some, some of you are interested. To, you know, you see these communities sending out scouting bands, kind of like the old settlers did. You know, send out five or six people to scout things out, see if you can find a place, make sure there's schools for the kids. And so you see these people, you know, driving in trucks through the community saying, uh, we're from the Carterets, so you don't know us, but our, our land is being overtaken by water. Have you got some land that, where we could settle? And over and over again, the community say, gee, we'd love to help, but you know, we just don't have that much land, and our population is growing, and you speak a different language, and yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll think about it. We'll get back to you. You know, so it's been 10 years of looking for a place to take them in. It would perhaps be aided if the government could put in some money and make it more attractive to communities to give up some of their scarce land. But it's, and it's difficult, too, for people who've been farmers and fishermen to think about adapting to a different environment. Alaska is a case that's closer to home. In Alaska, this is a house that's slipping off as a result of erosion and melting permafrost. Alaska has warmed twice as fast as the global average for the last 50 years that permafrost is melting, permafrost, which has been the basis for construction. Temperature increases have led to more erosion, more flooding. The sea ice served as a barrier against some of the storms and winds. As that sea ice melts, the winds and the hurricane force gales come in without that obstacle. Erosion has, has made it more difficult for little communities like these 17 or 19 indigenous communities to be resupplied regularly by the, by the barges bringing in supplies. So there's been erosion control and there's been flood protection measures and the government of Alaska I think has taken this very seriously. A lot of, a lot of commissions and studies and task forces from right and left, Republicans, Sarah Palin's been a big advocate. These communities need to be moved. It's not fair. Their sewage system doesn't work anymore because it's been under U.S. disaster law. If there's a disaster, U.S. government will help, help you rebuild. There are funds for that. But they won't help you rebuild someplace else. You can rebuild where you are, but you know, these communities are saying, we can't rebuild where we are. The permafrost is melting. We, we, we can't, we need to move. And we've identified a place up the road where we can settle. But, but so far, U.S. disaster funds haven't been able to, to deal with that. I read in actually, it was actually yesterday's um, Washington Post that Secretary of Interior, um, Sally Jewell, for the, for the first time ever, a senior U.S. government official went to visit one of these communities, looked around and said, we've got to do everything we can to help you move. It is very expensive. The studies that have been done for these small communities are estimating the cost of relocating, not just physically moving, not just building houses, but reestablishing infrastructure, are around $135,000 per person. Okay, you think maybe we can handle that for Alaska. These are small communities. And maybe thinking globally, even for the Carterets with the 27. But if in the future, in 20 years or 30 years, we're talking about millions of people who will have to be moved, and if we're talking about moving people who are the most vulnerable, you know, those with means have already gotten out, then the price tag could be enormous. Um, climate change impacts on Arctic people in, in many different ways. It isn't just these cases of Alaska of relocations, but you know, changing migratory patterns of, of fish and changing reindeer foraging habits and transportation possibilities. And then Typhoon Haiyan, I mentioned, the st strongest tropical cyclone ever to make landfall. Only 4,500 people died. I mean, that is just amazing. When you look at a storm with that velocity getting, affecting that many, 13 million people affected. Uh, but there was no famine, no disease outbreak. No secondary displacements. People were, were cared for. It, this was a system that largely worked. And the recovery plan was developed. As I mentioned, there are plans to permanently relocate a million people. It's bound to be complicated and take far longer than anybody anticipates. But this is a good case. There are many cases in the world where governments are much less prepared to deal with these challenges. Finally, lessons. What, what can we take from all this? I think we all, government, 
civil society, business groups, military, non-governmental organizations, aid organizations, all need to be preparing for a new normal, a normal with changed climate, a, a new normal where people are going to be moving. You know, it's very easy to say, I say this all the time, we need to invest more money in disaster risk reduction. We need to do, m put more money into preventing the worst effects of these disasters. And we always seem to be able to respond when something happens, but be much more effective. If we but you know, politically, it's really hard to do. It's hard to do in the U.S. It's hard to do in all countries. When you see immediate needs in your communities and you think, well, gosh, you know, I've got all those kids who don't have access to school and, you know, people are going hungry. Or I could think about preserving the marshlands. You know, the feeding hungry kids or the supporting local business always seems to take priority to those longer term things, in part because it's politics. If I'm the mayor of a city and I've got to decide on how to spend $500,000, I want something that will make me look good. You know, I want a new shipping dock or a new tourist industry or new roads or a new bridge, maybe with my name on it. But to do something that's going to benefit people 10 years from now, I'm not going to get credit for restoring those marshlands if we only see their value in 20 years. You see what I mean? There's a political payoff element that we haven't built into a system of disaster risk reduction. You know, what, what I hear, and I'm sure this, a lot of you do too, is from people around the world, please take measures now to stop the global warming and to mitigate the carbon uh, emissions. It would be so much better not to pollute so much, not to create these changes, than to have to respond to them. And, and finally, I'd say to get ready for an increasing number of people on the move. More people will be moving because of the effects of climate change. Our legal systems, both internationally and nationally, are woefully unprepared. I think there are things that can be done, such as Kiribati is doing, to use migration effectively as a tool for responding to the challenges in ways that make economic sense and that also respect the rights of people who may be forced to move. Because climate change ultimately is about people, and nobody in this world wants to leave their homes. Nobody wants to leave their community. It doesn't matter you know, if your community is wealthy or poor, it's, it's home. I remember talking with a woman from the Solomon Islands who was just in a small Pacific Island as well, who was, um, who was sobbing and she said, oh, all you Americans, you think of climate change in terms of targets and emissions and all I can think of is the grave of my mother. It's now up to my knees in water. This is not the way we respect our ancestors. Please don't do this to my mother and to our culture. So I leave you with that, with that note. Thanks. And I think we have time for questions. We do have time for a few questions. I just want to take one second, sort of an informal survey. Have any of, any of us undergone what you'd consider, suffered through a natural disaster at any point in your life? Just a few of us? Okay, maybe we can bring that into the discussion. Uh, how about family or friends who you know have suffered through something? Is that a few more? Not really. Just curious. Questions, comments, thought in the middle here, sir? Yeah, it seems to me that uh, with population shifts, especially large population shifts, <coughs> even within, within a country, uh, inevitably leads to friction. Uh, economic inequities, uh, differences in ethnicity, <coughs> culture, religion. Uh, and that can easily lead to conflict, outright yeah. war. Do you, and obviously, not every country in the world is going to invest the money and have the will to prepare for right. population shifts. So as a result, do you see the world in the greater conflict because of climate change? You know, I, I mentioned at the beginning, there are a lot of different models predicting how many people will move. Some of those models posit that with climate change, there'll be an increase in conflict precisely for this reason. People moving into territories that are new to them and conflict emerging, and that, that may well be the case. The World Bank studies posit an increase in conflict. Um, but it's not, it's not automatic. It kind of depends on how it's done and where people go. Frankly, I draw a lot of comfort from the U.S. We have, we have a lot of problems, but one of the things we do well 
is deal with people on the move. I mean, we are a transitory society. People move cross country all the time. Refugees come, immigrants come. They, you know, treatment isn't always great, but they, they adapt. They're part of it. I, I think that's something we, we have to offer to the rest of I mean, if I can just tell one little story. We lived in Sweden for a couple of years, and Sweden had a most generous policy for refugees. Refugees resettled in Sweden at the time got three years of full assistance at the same salary I was making as research director for a research institute. I mean, well, pretty well paid. And they got support with language and help with jobs. Three years to settle in. I remember talking to one Iraqi refugee. He says, I can't wait to go to the U.S. I said, boy, you're crazy. You've got three years of support here. In the U.S., you get Medicaid for six months or something, and you're expected to be at work within 90 days, and no help with the language unless there are volunteers who are doing it on the side. Um, why in the world do you want to come to the U.S.? And he said, in Sweden, my kids will never be Swedes. In the U.S., I know my kids will be Americans. And there is something very precious in that statement that America has that I think offers something to these questions of how to integrate people who are different. Right in front here, and then you, sir. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, retired from NASA, and there's ah. so much interesting data that they have. But it's interesting you mentioned some of the Arctic regions. But to me, some of the pictures that have recently been taken of Siberia of these methane explosions, uh, you know, basically trapped methane gas, and as the, uh, just as right. the permafrost goes, too much pressure. Exactly. So I just think people need to visualize. And you know, when the East was so cold, the thing, I keep talking to all my old people, and they think I'm a little off the rocker, but what, what I see is this tremendous oscillation of things like the jet stream right. and quasi permanent. You know, when we were getting so much snow and cold in the east, two thirds of Alaska for one of those days had high temperatures above freezing. Yeah. So you had this oscillation coming. Right. I guess, it, and I'm a systems engineer, is there something that, that we can tie, I think, with, with, the, uh, with the climate change too and the, and the, you know, the greenhouse gases? Can we tie it together so we can have people sort of move inland to build a wind farm or move from a coal mine to, uh, you know, putting solar everywhere or uh, reforestation, moving right. from a, uh, an area like that to, to an area that, that needs reforestation? I guess it, it kind of all comes down to who's going to do that kind of funding, but some of it long term at least will pay for itself if you put, right. anyway, what, what about those ideas of trying to tie apples and oranges together? So I think that's what we need to be doing. We need to be thinking about that and thinking about ways to encourage, not force people to move, to offer packages or incentives or better jobs or something so that people will be attracted to live in places that are, that are more sustainable. I mean, but that requires a change of mindset. And in a lot of parts of the world, there's a sense that it's really not that bad. We've got time. I've got more pressing things to worry about. And I don't really want to even think about that. In the Pacific, you know, there are a lot of governments don't want to think about it. We want, we want this to stop. We're not ready to give up our hope that climate change can somehow be reversed. It's, you know, so I think that there's some political issues around, do we want our governments to have the power to move us? to make our lives uncomfortable where we are. I mean, I think in the U.S. there's, there's a, I think, a good degree of trust in our government, and a lot of places there isn't. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times governments will say, we're moving you for environmental reasons, and we want your land for economic development, a lot of land grabbing going on. And I find, just to say a word, you know, there is this feedback loop. Uh, temperatures rise in the Arctic, permafrost melts, methane is released, increasing global warming is this, this vicious cycle, if you will. Sir? Yeah, everything I read about climate change in your lecture here, you always hear about the negative effects. There are some positive effects. We've had the most mild winters the last two years here. It's the summer, 80 degrees in February. It's amazing. 
So in other parts of the country, they have longer growing seasons. Mm -hmm. How come scientists such as yourself don't look and look at some of the good aspects? Why don't you move to Canada where you can grow wheat now? Mm -hmm. uh, do they look and, and investigate that kind of yeah, stuff? And also, when you look at movement of people, you see some positive things. So you see, for example, that people can uh, uh, have new livelihood opportunities in Greenland because the uh, cod is moving further north, or there are new fishing possibilities, which mean more development, which mean better standards of living. Uh, in the case of Greenland, might eventually mean independence from Denmark. There, there are positive things that happen. Um, but rarely do these things come on their own. I mean, as you see more drilling and there more mineral exploitation in the Arctic, you see more non-indigenous people moving, also threatening some of the indigenous culture. It is a mixed bag. I agree, agree with you. I think maybe we emphasize the negative so much because people don't want to hear it. You know, people don't want to plan for it or think about it. It's, it's too easy to think, well, this isn't going to happen here. Or I'll be long gone. Or let, my, let my grandkids deal with this. It's, I don't know. And maybe a, a realization that if we start thinking now, maybe we could prevent the worst things from happening. Thank you for that question. Anybody? Oh, yes, sir. Oh. Uh, thank you for a very uh, thought-provoking lecture. But I'm left uh, with a deep sense of sadness and uh, uh, grief and hopelessness under, as a result of what you've put forth. Uh, can you help me out uh, with regard to what is the best piece of evidence that you have with regard to the inevitability of what you presented? That is the best definition of climate change, the best theoretical and also scientific evidence. Is there something I need to read that is a, that is the best support for the sadness that you've given me this, this evening? I think the most authoritative reports are those coming out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is a collection of hundreds of scientists working all around the world, doing their studies, trying to synthesize long, complicated processes to arrive at their assessments, but I think it's probably the best we have. There have been a number of excellent studies on this. Uh, the, the UK government, uh, you know, report called Foresight by their Department of Science, got together 70 scientists to look at what it's going to mean for the movement of people. And what they found is it isn't inevitable, that there are ways that people can stay where they are, that there are adaptation techniques that we haven't even thought of yet. One of the reasons some of these estimates of millions and millions of people are moving are probably off is they don't take into account the amazing creativity of human beings. I mean, who would have thought that Bangladesh would have reduced their fatalities from cyclones from 300,000 to 3,000? I mean, it's amazing. You know, they built you know, these incredible uh, shelters on stilts, and then they found out people wouldn't go because they didn't want to leave their animals. So they put long ramps so people could take their animals up in these typhoon shelters. Uh, I mean, people can do amazing things to enable themselves to stay where they are. I think we need to, you know, kind of hold up those positive examples, and we also need to give more support to them. That's where that's where things are happening at the community level. May I have a follow up. One of the things that does concern me is when I hear uh, people talk about scientific consensus, uh -huh. and what I think about at that point is Galileo. And scientific consensus, consensus, I don't know that we did science by the numbers. That is, we count scientists as opposed to their found findings. So I'm, I'm interested in whether or not this idea of scientific consensus is part of a scientist's DNA, that they want to be counted by the numbers. I thought they were always challenging ideas, especially scientific consensus. Yeah, I, mean, I think scientists tend to be a very independent breed, and you're right, the idea of scientific consensus is sometimes a, a misnomer. But some things seem very clear. They also go by the evidence. And this is what we are observing. In the island of Tuvalu, the sea level was this, this high this year, and it's this high this year. And this is an increase. It's, anybody can see that. It's some, you know, where there gets to be more conjecture is kind of what's going to happen next. I didn't cite any figures about how many people will move, because there isn't a consensus. 
The estimates range from you know, 20 million to a billion people over different, using different models and different predictive formulas, and probably none of them are totally accurate. We don't know how many people are going to know move. We don't know how fast temperature is going to increase. But we can say you know, the evidence is, you know, based on observable phenomena, um, you know, this is what's happened and what is likely to happen if we don't, don't change. Uh, follow up question. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Sorry. You have a second. I'm sorry. Yeah. I realize this is just an opinion, but why do you think political leaders are, you know, keep on denying global warning, warming? I mean, it seems like the evidence is pretty clear that it's happening. I think the evidence is clear, but there are a lot of scientists publishing different things. To take it seriously means to change the way we live. And that's politically very difficult to do. To take it seriously, it isn't enough just to recycle your aluminum cans. To reduce dependence on the automobile, oh my goodness. You know, to take serious measures to reduce emissions, uh, threaten our lifestyles, and that's really, really uncomfortable. that a complete change in the way we use carbon energy will end, end climate change? I don't know. I, I, I'm not enough of a hard scientist to know that, but certainly the carbon emissions are the main driver of the, the global warming we're seeing now, or fossil fuel emissions, yeah. I like that you pointed out we can't underestimate the, the power of people. And I recently have just been reading about social movements um, and some, some of the positive effects of today's social movements being that we're more of a network society. Um, are there social movements around this kind of um, topic? And I, I, not that I've heard of any, but um, are they not growing because of a specific reason? Or Because I think about the think locally, act globally, and social movements are so can be so positive to get um, global cooperation. There are hundreds and thousands of groups organized around climate change. Uh, many of them will show up in Paris for the climate change negotiations. Many of them are very carefully lobbying, advocating, educating, preparing a response to urge global leaders to come up with an agreement that will make it, the movement is there. But you know these movements kind of come and go. There are times when green movements are everywhere and then you don't see them for a few years and they surface again. I mean, it's kind of dismaying in comparison, say, with the women's movement or civil rights movement or some of the other major social movements in this country that the green movement or the climate change movement hasn't, hasn't been a steady trajectory. It's been kind of up and down. honor your time and patience and uh, try and end on time. Thank you very much, especially for your questions. That was always the best part of it. Excuse me, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best parts of having One the lecture. Uh, let me just give you a commercial as you're leaving. Uh, our next lecture will be in two weeks, so don't show up next week. <laughs> uh, we'll have uh, colleague Joshua Meltzer will be back out from Brookings. and. We'll continue sort of our global theme of looking at issues. We'll be looking at global trade and international trade agreements, what the U.S. is doing right, what it may not be doing right, what else it could do. So it'll sort of be an economic and trade topic in a couple of weeks. And for those of you who might want to refer to any of uh, Elizabeth's uh, uh, PowerPoints, it's already up on our Brookings Mountain website, so you can refer to the presentation there. Thanks to our colleagues here in Greenspun, we'll have the lecture itself up in a few days, and we hope to see you in two weeks. Thanks. Thanks.